Okay, we're about to start. The doors are closing and the stars are aligning because this is somewhat of a legendary panel. I think it's probably as legendary as they come in a kind of recent history of contemporary African art. So this panel is going to focus on Revue Noir, a journal that was active between 1991 and 2001. It was a magazine for contemporary African art, among the first, and maybe they'll correct me, maybe it was the first, uh, but certainly inspired a generation of curators, writers, artists to sort of think further uh, beyond the kind of pre-existing boundaries at the time. So 30 years ago, very few African artists or photographers were known on the international art scene. Revue Noir, the magazine of contemporary art, radically changed that, giving a much needed attention to contemporary creators from Africa and its diaspora, simultaneously challenging the perceptions on the continent. The roundtable discussion is the initial team. You can refer to them as a family, a ma mafia, or <laughs> however you want to frame it, but I, they prefer family. <laughs> <laughs> <Thank you>. So, <laughs> On this panel, we'll have Ngoni Fall, uh, independent curator, writer, and cultural consultant. Uh, Fall has curated exhibitions biennales and biennales in Africa, Europe, and the USA. She was previously editorial director at Revue Noir from 1994 to 2001. She is the author of strategic plans, orientation programs, and evaluation reports on a national and international scale for cultural institutions and foundations. She's held professorships at Singor University in Alexandria and the University of Cape Town, to name a few. Uh, Fall, who was recently appointed as the General Commissioner of Africa 2020, a series of events on culture, sciences, and entrepreneurship to be held in France between June and December 2020. Then we have uh, Pascal Martin saint leon architect, and Jean-Luc Pivin, also an architect, co-founders of Revue Noir, together with Simone and Jemmy. Uh, Pascal and Jean Loup are architects by profession and founders of Revue Noir with Simon and Jemmy and Bruno uh, Tilliette um, in 1991. Uh, having worked together since the 1970s, they began their careers as architects of the National Museum in Bamako, Mali. Uh, since then, they have worked together on over 200 heritage projects in Africa. The legacy of Revue Noir includes the production of films, musical recordings, and exhibitions. And this year, Revue Noir co-produced the first pavilion of Madagascar here at the Venice Biennale, which is the Beck of the Asinale. I went yesterday, I recommend it. Um, they are also authors and co-authors of numerous books, including most recently Act of Utopia, published in January 2019. Then we have Simon and Jemmy. Simon and Jemmy is an independent curator, critic, and essayist, um, having received an MA in art history and philosophy. Um, and a PhD in law and modern literature, and Jemmy has curated numerous exhibitions on African art and photography, including Africa Remix, Contemporary African Art of the Continent, which toured to numerous locations between 2004 and 2007. He was the co-curator of the first African pavilion together with Fernando Elvim at the, 90, uh, the uh, 52nd Venice Biennale in 2007. He's also the co-founder and was the editor-in-chief of Revue Noir. Uh, this panel will be uh, moderated by uh, Reza Nadu, Nadu, uh, independent curator and writer, uh, having served as director of the National Gallery in South Africa from 2009 to 2016. Uh, he's had numerous projects, including Any Given Sunday in 2016 in Cape Town and the documentary Legends of, of Kesper with uh, Damon, uh, Damon uh, Heatley in 2016. He has curated the retrospective exhibitions of Rajith Kali and Peter Clark, to name a few. He is the author and curator of the Indian in Drum magazine um, in the 1950s, um, a book and exhibition that took place in 2008. Um, he has been uh, a, la uh, a laureate of the Institut Francais, as well as the, the City des Arts International in Paris, um, and among other things. And he's currently completing a PhD, I found out today, on the history of Revue Noir. So this should be a really rich and engaging dialogue and we're incredibly honored and proud to have them. So if you could give another round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Osei. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, l'Institut Francais, l'Institut Francais en Afrique du Sud, Cité Internationale des Arts, Rive Noire, and African Art in Venice Forum. Thank you for all supporting us. Uh, we're going to do this panel in English mainly, but also in a bit of French. Uh, so in some moments uh, we will translate um, some of uh, Jean-Loup and Pascal's uh, responses. 
uh, from French into English. Just a brief introduction. Uh, Rive Noir was published uh, quarterly from 2001. There are 35 uh, issues in total, uh, in large format colors, in French and English, sometimes also in Portuguese and Spanish. Um, architect uh, Ngoni Fal, in fact there are three architects on this panel, uh, joined the team in 1994. Arising in response to the exhibition Magicians de la Terre, 1989 at the Pompidou, curated by Jean-Hubert Martin, Rive Noir listed its intentions to reveal an Africa that is multiple, complex, and moving, not a single entity that the views of ethnology or exotic folklore would summarize. The agenda, therefore, was to reveal the vitality and inventiveness peculiar to a contemporary and urban Africa in all its creative disciplines, from visual art and photography to literature, theater, music, film, video, design, and dance. Today, we cannot think of contemporary African art without thinking of Rive Noir, the foundation of the making of a category. So I'll just kick off uh, with a few questions and uh, our panelists, please uh, respond um, as you want. Uh, the mic's in front of you. But Jean-Luc, I'll start with, with you. Um, in one of the editions, I think it was edition issue 20, you reiterate your frustration with the Magicians de la Terre exhibition, where Paris is still looking to Africa for tribalism and colonial myths, whereas African culture has evolved with modern and contemporary influences in all walks of life, notwithstanding the visual arts. And I quote, we cannot go on much longer being satisfied with a recognition of ritual African arts that are still stubbornly called primitive without the new modern Africa being able to express itself. So for those of us in the audience who are not familiar with Rive Noir, please tell us how Rive Noir came about and why. <rire> on est arrivé. Il n'y a pas de jeu. C'est vraiment d'entrée de jeu une aventure collective. C'est une aventure qui n'existe qu'avec Simon, Bruno Tillet et Pascal. Donc on est dans une problématique d'entrée de jeu où on en avait assez d'avoir toujours ces mêmes images et cette méconnaissance totale de ce qui pouvait se passer dans les villes plus que dans les campagnes avec des cornues et des et de la paille sur les toits. Donc, donc notre, travail, notre, notre envie était celle-ci. À part cela, il y avait aussi une deuxième chose, il faut peut-être traduire, c'est compliqué, il y avait peut-être une deuxième chose qui, 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 qui a joué, c'est de s'apercevoir ce problème du patrimoine qui est si à fleur de peau aujourd'hui, où pendant dix ans, moi, je n'étais pas amusé, je, je faisais beaucoup de missions en matière de patrimoine sur beaucoup de pays, pour la France, euh, et je m'étais rendu compte qu'il y avait un, un problème sur, le, sur cette euh, notion de patrimoine qu'il fallait conserver à travers des structures euh, à l'européenne, enfin, comme des musées, etc. Et on, on s'apercevait par contre qu'il y avait un appétit de montrer que l'Afrique était moderne, l'Afrique était d'aujourd'hui, elle n'était pas, pas forcément liée à son, à son folklore. Et c'est probablement le vrai problème qu'on a aujourd'hui sur la problématique même du patrimoine. C'est qu'on est effectivement sur une problématique un peu compliquée de, 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 de savoir ce que l'on veut avoir comme image de soi-même. Est-ce que c'est une image qui est tournée vers le passé ou une image qui est tournée vers l'avenir Nous, on avait... Voilà. 
so I, I, de toute façon, tu peux le prendre à ton, à ton, à ton compte, tu n'as pas besoin de moi. Just try to, to summarize. Um, the, the, the genre started first because uh, uh, the magazine started with the four founders because they were sick, the founders, to see all those images of Africa, blah, 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 blah. And uh, what they wanted to do was to, to, to show an Africa from the cities and not from the villages. Because if you talk about villages, there are villages everywhere. But uh, the only image of Africa that was shown was, was um, the, the Africa, the authentic Africa. The other thing is that um, the heritage, uh, Jean is an architect and he's been working uh, on that field for, for a while. And as he said, for the French Republic. So he, he've done missions, etc., etc. It's like, how do you deal with the, the heritage? How, how do you maintain it? How do you make it? Um, how do you transform it into into a useful tool for today and for the future? Continue. No, ça va. Ça va. s'arrêter là. Tu te vois jeter. Non, on peut même dire, on peut prendre l'exemple que, que nous avions fait avec Simon. C'est notre projet n'était pas de faire une revue. Notre projet était de faire une grande exposition sur la, sur la, la, l'Afrique contemporaine qui s'appelait Dans la ville noire qui est un projet qui n'a pas pu se faire parce que les magiciens de la Terre avaient occupé l'intégralité de l'espace. Ça devait se faire en 89, hein, pour les 200 ans de la Révolution française. Et c'est vrai qu'on n'a pas pu faire cette exposition. Il est resté la revue. Voilà. So the, the initial idea was not necessarily to, to make a magazine, it was to, to make a show, a big show that was called and titled In the Black City. But uh, unfortunately, the, their magicians occupied all the space, so there was no room for that exhibition to happen. So, so we did a magazine. Uh, Just to follow up on that, um, Simone, I'm going to go directly to you, because I read somewhere in the literature uh, Jean Loup, I think it was you who said uh, Rive Noir would not have existed if it was not for Simon and Jamie. And uh, I mean, of course, there is the we know of this exhibition Ethnicolor uh, two years before, or the project uh, Ethnicolor two years before uh, Magicians de la Terre. Um, so, Simon, maybe you want to respond to that. Uh, f- first of all, I, I want to say that I, I, I feel really sorry that I was not there yesterday because I was told that there was a brilliant German uh, scholar. I <laughs> don't know if she's here today. I've been telling so many craps and I, I wish I would have been there to respond, but I was not there. Uh, to, to go back to your uh, question. Um, I think Revenoir wouldn't have existed without Revenoir existing. Um, personally, um, there's not much I knew about Africa before we started Revenoir. Well, I knew Cameroon, I knew the Bassa land, I knew my place. I wouldn't even say Cameroon, not the Bassa land. And uh, when I met those guys, they, they knew Africa much more than me. They, I mean, it is a civil. Uh, duties in uh, in Mali when I was 18, etc., etc. So um, it was nice, uh, thanks to them, for me to to think of myself as uh, as some African. And of course, Revenoir was not made uh, about um, Africa, about all those stupid post-colonial and post-whatever bullshit that are running around for the past 10 years. It, it was, uh, Renoir was made just to, to talk the talk, uh, to show the creativity. Uh, it was funny to, to be coming from where I'm coming. And uh, when I was a kid, you know, yeah, where are you coming from? I would say Lausanne. I would say no, but this was the other thing. Uh, well, I mean, I think Renoir was not much interested about Africa. I think we're interested about uh, contemporary creation and uh, we're interested in uh, the places where it was the most vibrant. And the places where it was the most vibrant were Africa and and the non-Western world. 
So, we did Africa. In issue 20 on, on Paris, uh, there's a piece by you as well, Simon. Um, Revue du, I read about Revue du Monde Noir, the review of the black world, founded towards the end of the 1920s by the West Indian Nadal sisters. How did, did the na name Revue Noir come about? Was it inspired by Revue du, du Monde Noir and the 20s in Paris, which was a very vibrant time, especially with uh, black Americans in Paris at the time. Uh, how did you come, come up with the name, Rivinoir? Noir? I, I shall let Jean-Lou and Gonet talk about it because, uh, make no mistake, uh, Revue, th th there was a moment in the 20s where you have the Revue, you know, musical shows. So we went to show business now. And, and Goni wanted to, to descend this, this big, no, it was about uh, show business. <laughs> Il y a quand même des références. Il y a effectivement Joséphine Baker, Baker. Il y a, mais il y, a aussi, euh, il y a aussi la revue Blanche qui a existé, qui était une revue aussi de contestation. Euh, qui, qui, qui a, voilà. donc, il y a, donc il y avait une espèce de pendant comme ça qui nous semblait amusant. On, on a eu beaucoup de mal à trouver ce qu'on a fait reconnaître, oui. <laughs> so there was uh, at the time also a uh, review, Revue Blanc, uh, a white review uh, that existed at the time. And uh, anyway, it was a roundabout way, but um, that's how the name Revue Noir came about. So uh, would you agree that Revue Noir and the term contemporary African art, as well as the interest in contemporary African art, developed simultaneously, and this is open to, to all of you. Uh, in, and that I mean, you know, and secondly, what is contemporary African art? I mean, we're all using the term all the time, contemporary African art, everybody is in contemporary African art. We're all here in this room uh, interested in contemporary African art. Uh, can we talk about a date when contemporary African art emerged, like people talk about contemporary art in general terms as following the Second World War or from the 1960s. But when we are talking about contemporary African art, uh, when, when was the term used and when can we talk about contemporary African art? Can we pinpoint a date? Yes. Huh? Mais non, oui. non, bon, ça ce sont des ce sont des abus de langage. Hein? Soit, pardon. Non, ça. Ce sont des abus de langage. Nous, on a fait ça par facilité. On ne savait pas exactement là où on mettait les pieds quand même. Euh, donc, l'art contemporain est effectivement un mouvement de l'art occidental qui petit à petit a, a, a fonctionné un petit peu dans le monde entier et a, recou et a repris tout, les, les, plusieurs modes de diffusion, enfin plus, plusieurs médias, plusieurs euh, et, et les pays petit à petit se sont, se sont agrégés. Donc il y avait effectivement nous un, un désir de repérer aussi des gens qui faisaient de l'art contemporain, mais en réalité, un peu, on prenait le terme aussi à son sens, qui n'était pas comme un mouvement, mais comme l'art d'aujourd'hui. C'est pour ça qu'avec le temps, on a plutôt, je dirais, appelé les expressions contemporaines en Afrique. Le vrai terme, qu'on a mis du temps à, à mettre en place, mais c'est exactement ça. C'est les expressions contemporaines en Afrique, et c'est pas l'art contemporain africain qui, effectivement, on ferait croire qu'il y aurait un art contemporain. Euh, voilà. Donc, euh, je ne je, je sais pas qui veut continuer sur le... Euh, reprendre et continuer l'argument. Euh, Simon ou Gonnet, tu veux pas So, th th there was this, this trend, or this cool uh, uh, western African uh, came after the, the contemporaneity. So when we started 
I'm summarizing what Jean-Luc said. Uh, so when we started, we we really didn't know and not really cared about uh, what would uh, contemporary African art be. And um, we used the expression as a commodity because it was easier that way. But at the end of the day, we found out that the best way to to name that field uh, would be to call it uh, contemporary expressions because the way we use contemporary was in the here and now and not necessarily in the way that the West would use it. Yeah, just to add, so contemporary as in uh, what was happening in Africa at that time, so it was contemporary to Africa, mm -hmm. but also not a movement. It wasn't a, you know, like surrealism or anything like that. It wasn't a movement, but rather uh, this is contemporary. This is happening. What's this is happening in Africa right now? Uh, Simon, do you want to add to that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Simon. Um, third text was founded in 1987. And uh, uh, Third Text describes itself as uh, a critical forum for discussion and appraisal of the work of artists hitherto marginalized through racial, sexual, and cultural differences, and to broaden the frameworks and criteria of what has become international contemporary art practice. How was Rivinoir different to Third Text? Well, f f first of all, uh, Rashid Irene was not one of the Revinois founder, so it makes a difference, because Rashid is the founder of Third Text. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and I think Revinois never dealt with his race, um, never dealt with politics in the, the basic sense of it. If Revinois dealt with politics, it was in the, the most um, philosophical way. Uh, it was not about uh, uh, black and white or criticism. Uh, it was about showing things and showing a, a movement and, uh, and not a revendication. Uh, we're not claiming anything and we're not saying the world is uh, hard on the poor Africans, etc. We're just showing that there was something called Africa and there was something called uh, African contemporary art. And, uh, and Rashid was in another position. I mean, London back then, uh, we've been there, we, we did an issue on, on, on London. Uh, the leader, the prime minister was Maggie Thatcher. And it was a very hard time and uh, the, the, the British had a very uh, a very strong political attitude about blackness, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There was this uh, organization um, of African photographer autograph that was black photography. We were not into these kind of things. We were much more into poetics, into showing and not demonstrating. Rashid was angry. We were happy. But I mean, it's good to be angry every now and then. We're all angry every now and then. But I mean, this was not uh, our our flavor. On, on that subject of uh, London and the British scene, because, um, you know, in the British context, blackness refers to a, a more broader um, term of people who are not white. Actually, it comes from non-white, and then it's um, you know, it, it black refers to anyone of color, um, which is quite different, uh, maybe to the the French Franco francophone scene. Uh, I mean, I know Simon. I, I read in those editions on London. Uh, Pascal, you also did uh, London with Simon. Um, were you quite surprised by this term uh, of black, including people of color? Uh, oui, bien sûr, on était peut-être un peu surpris euh, au départ, mais en fait, je trouve que c'était une bonne attitude. Nous-mêmes, quand on a commencé Revue Noire, c'est notre histoire personnelle un peu à tous qui a fait qu'on s'est centré sur 
le continent africain, le continent enfin, des, 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 disons, des artistes et de tous les créateurs en Afrique, comme de la diaspora africaine d'ailleurs, et que ce soit l'Afrique francophone, lusophone ou anglophone. Et... Euh, euh, je ne sais plus où j'en suis. Et <rire> black, euh, pas black, hein. Oui, et, et de, retrouver, euh, de, de retrouver en Angleterre euh, une espèce de, de, une union, euh, de, que ce soit des, des Indiens, d'Indonésie des, de, 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 ou de, euh, du Pakistan et d'Afrique aussi, que tous ces, ces créateurs se réunissent ensemble autour d'associations et et se mettre dans le même combat, en quelque sorte. Oui, je trouve ça très, c'est très compréhensible. Et nous-mêmes, oui, ce que je voulais dire, c'est que nous-mêmes, donc on avait, on s'était orienté sur l'Afrique par rapport à notre histoire personnelle, parce que on avait chacun un background. Mais en fait, notre notre profonde envie ça aurait été de de pouvoir faire le même type de revue ou avoir le même type de regard sur l'ensemble du continent par rapport à des courants émergents, à des, à des, à des expressions non officielles, etc. So we, we, we started revenu out of a personal desire, etc. And of course, I went to London and we saw that things were organized into groups, you know, the black this, the black that. Uh, we found it surprising at the beginning, but at the same time it was, it was, it was normal. They, they, they were doing what they, they had to do. But our story was, was much more personal. We went there because we felt like doing it and not out of some political decision. And what he almost forgot then he re remembered, is that at the end of the day, it was not just uh, about Africa or about art. It was about all the, the, the contemporary expressions uh, that we wanted to talk about. And if we would have lasted longer, uh, the magazine would have had another, another form and another expression. And Goni, I'm going to direct this to you. Um, because you entered uh, Rive Noire uh, in, in, huh? in March. In March? Uh, okay, I s uh, <laughs> 1994, not September. No, because the issue came out in September. Ah, it came out in September, so you're working six months in advance. Um, and uh, the issue that I saw your name first was uh, on dance. Mm -hmm. uh, and Goni, tell us what it was like from your perspective to work at and with Rive Noire. I note also that you were involved in the anthologies of African photography and uh, on art. And how did that prepare you for your career as a curator? Uh, okay. Just to follow up on this idea of third text uh, and, and Revue Noir, you also have to understand the context back in the, in the 90s. UK is not France. Uh, France does not allow until now communities and racial uh, classification. Uh, and I will just add, uh, I come from a continent where not everybody is black. We have some white Africans uh, in Southern Africa, but also in North Africa. Maryam sitting right next to me is, is an editor from Morocco. So the idea of black does not refer uh, to a color in our mind, but to more to a state of mind and what you stand for. So it was maybe the same kind of struggle and journey, but if you have to put it back in the context of what was the UK in the eight, late 80s and 90s, and what was France uh, in, that same, uh, in that same time. Uh, and you're asking me, what was it like to join? Well, he convinced me, he harassed me for six months. Uh, I was a just young architect, and we met discussing my graduation project, and I was curious to meet uh, a French architect who did build uh, amazing building that I really liked uh, in uh, West Africa. I'm from Senegal. And then I was uh, receiving a Renoir because I subscribed when it came out. I heard about it. And then I was just told that the guy who started a Renoir is also the architect that I admired. So for me, it was obvious to meet the guy. So he accepted, we met, and it was supposed to be like half an hour conversation, and we spoke for like five hours. 
uh, and then he was saying, you have to come and join the team, we want to expand. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm not an art editor. Yes, I did a little bit of art history, but I'm an architect and I want to stay an architect. He convinced me, obviously, that's why I, I joined, let's say, so I used to say, it's Ngoni and the boys. Um, and Joel used to call me the boss because of my large voice. Uh, so what was it like? Uh, I, I call it a human adventure. I think uh, all of us, the four of us, and all the other people who did work at Revue Noir, we will not be where we are today without that adventure. Uh, because for me, the motivation was, oh my God, there's this crazy French guy who is going to pay me to discover my own continent. We keep on saying we're Africans, but we don't know that continent. And in the 90s, for those who are too young, there was no internet, no mobile phones. So you had to go to those places to know what was happening. Otherwise, there's no information coming out. And he was ready to pay me to, to, to do the job. So of course, I was excited. And I was thinking, OK, I can do that for maybe a year, travel around, meet the freedom fighters of independent struggles. That was my main motivation. And then go back to architecture, which I never did, obviously. Uh, but it was a great adventure to discover my own continent. So when I say I'm an African, I know what I'm talking about. And the people I met is not just the artists, the intellectuals, the freedom fighters, the dreamers. It's about the, the failures, the dreams, the battles of that continent from South Africa to, to Egypt and crisscrossing different uh, places in very turbulent times in the 19th. We were stuck with Simon uh, at the border between, where was that, Ghana, Ghana and Togo. And I had, because uh, in West Africa we all have the same passport, but he's from Cameroon. So I had to pay for him to get out of Ghana, and we were stuck. Uh, at, so we had those kind of crazy, and of course that creates bounds. So we are four, but we are like a family, an old couple. We kept disagreeing all the time. So when people refer to Reverend Noir, there's this kind of love and hate, because we had a kind of monopoly by default, because we were the first and the only ones. And all the, there was a lot of expectations from artists saying, if I'm not published in Revue Noir, I don't exist. But it was a 64 pages magazine, and we cannot publish everybody. So, so a lot of people were frustrated. They were like, oh, I only had one image. I wanted 10 pages. Mm -hmm. Or others saying, you never published me. Uh, but they have no idea that the four of us are very four strong, very strong personalities. We disagreed a lot on everything, but thanks to good wine, and the, and the nice cooking of his mother. So we had amazing editorial. I, sometimes we were like night shifting and I even slept there for like two weeks uh, on, uh, on the, on the, in the office. So yes, so it really did impact us and the people we met and also how we relate to each other. Uh, I think we will not be the, here, each of us. And we learned down the road because as you said, I, I was trained as an architect, working as an architect. Pascal and jean louis are architects. Simon comes from literature. So we all dived into being an art editor, but we learned from the ground. And because we were traveling on the continent and we were one of the few traveling of the continent, we knew what was happening in those cities. So we had this kind of expertise. And so we were approached by, let's say, the Francophonie organization or European Union asked to do reports. So that's how we became consultants. Uh, so every, and, and then seeing exhibitions happening in France where people say, oh, let's do an African show. It was driving us crazy. So we said, no, let's tell them what a show is about. And so down the road, little by little, that's how from doing the magazine, we started doing monographs of artists, then we ended up doing these two anthologies trying to recap, uh, let's say, that uh, those 10 years a journey, uh, but then doing talks, discussions, exhibitions, reports. Uh, so that's why I really call it a human adventure, because I will not be where I am today uh, if I didn't have that first conversation with jean Lou, where he really challenged me intellectually. I'm like, OK, he's challenging me, and I challenged him back. And that was half an hour ended for, for five hours. Then I met the two other boys, and then the story uh, went on. But it was, it, was, it was great, it was exhausting, because as you can see, it's a very small team, uh, and Pascal and myself were the only ones working full-time and paid. That is important to say. Uh, jean louis was volunteered, Simon was volunteered. So it makes the team even smaller. People don't realize that, that you're doing the quarterly issue, French-English magazine, but going to a different continent, to a different country uh, every, uh, every time to, to, to release an issue, doing the books, doing the talks, doing the exhibitions, doing the reports. 
So it was a lot of work, but of course you don't see, I, you don't even see those, day, those, those hours and those, it's not about counting like I want my paycheck. It was just about this kind of belief, it has to be done. You have to change the narrative, you have to change the perspective and the way things are, were happening back in those days just could not continue. So it was not about making kind of critical discourse because we don't come from social science or from political yeah. science. We're not art historians, we're not curators. And maybe that's what gave us the freedom to, to go all over the place, but in a very strategic way, I will say. I just want to add something. Bravo. Oui, j'aimerais rajouter une chose sur le, le texte et l'image. Parce que nous, dès le départ, euh, enfin bon, il existait euh, certainement, des, il y avait, oui, euh, comme ça, texte et d'autres, des, des revues ou des magazines euh, avec euh, essentiellement des textes qui essayaient d'expliquer, de, de replacer les choses. Mais le langage, ce n'est pas quelque chose d'anodin, c'est chargé de... Euh, Derrière le langage, il y, a, il y a une culture, il y a une façon de voir les choses et tout ça, qui fait que pour nous, dès le départ, il était essentiel, avant même de parler d'eux, d'avoir un discours sur quelque chose, il était essentiel pour nous de montrer ces créations d'aujourd'hui en Afrique. C'est pour ça qu'on a fait aussi des livres, des, des CD musicaux, etc. etc. Et des oui, parce qu'à le... sans critique. Voilà. En quelque sorte, sans appareil critique. Parce qu'en 90, les appareils critiques, finalement, euh, ils étaient assez faibles. Qui avaient une connaissance d'une véritable histoire euh, de l'art euh, d'aujourd'hui, enfin de notre siècle au moins, en Afrique. Il n'y avait pratiquement aucun ouvrage qui permettait, qui synthétisait cet ensemble. Et c'est. Il nous s'en semble. Euh, voilà. Il y a quelque chose que je voulais ajouter says Pascal, is uh, the relationship between the text and the image. Uh, there are magazines, so he, he, he referred to, to third text, for instance. I don't know if you're familiar with his third text, but a lot of magazines, a lot of text. Not only the third text, it was like a 100% text. Uh, so what Pascal says is that when, when you talk about something, what was important to us was to show what we're talking about. So the image was as important as the text is, if not more, because the image is a language. And uh, we talk about a period where uh, there was no critique, there was no knowledge about whatever is called African art. I would add the only knowledge that existed was uh, anthropological or ethnographic, which means the culture or the sense of the other. So uh, what was important was to show things and to talk about things and not to pretend that we would be deciphering them or explaining them to people. No, no critical approach. But I would add to that no critical approach that our critical approach were, was the way we're showing things. If you'd have a small image, it meant that uh, you didn't have a big image. So. There was no need to say, we like this or we don't like this. We're just showing. So the relationship with image and text, where the image is as strong as the text. Oui. Euh, L'essentiel du travail d'un critique, quand on regarde les articles qui sont publiés, c'est de faire référence à une histoire de l'art, à référence à d'autres artistes de par le passé. Donc, euh, en 90, euh, aller écrire euh, comme ça, de, de but en blanc, euh, sur un artiste africain ou euh, un, gour, un courant artistique en Afrique, ça voulait dire, en fait, et c'est ce qui est arrivé, ça voulait dire, en fait, prendre l'histoire de l'art occidental comme référence. C'est-à-dire regarder une œuvre comme euh, on, on regarderait euh, un Léonard de Vinci ou un... Giacometti. Nous, on voulait justement arriver à travers le... Euh, en... C'est lui qui va, tu balances, je veux balancer, laisse-le finir. Donc, je, moi, nous, ce qu'on voulait faire, c'était en quelque sorte permettre à travers un certain apprentissage, en quelque sorte, du regard, dans ce qu'on le montrait euh, dans la revue, à ce que l'on ait 
une autre façon de regarder, d'accepter que les références culturelles ne soient pas celles de l'art occidental, de l'art occidental, de l'histoire de l'art occidental. Alors, euh, on n'est pas forcément arrivé à, à créer, à, à mettre en place tous les éléments, mais on a, à travers notamment l'anthologie de l'art africain au XXe siècle, on a cherché à mettre en place quelques éléments du XXe du, du siècle qui permettraient, qui va permettre, j'espère, petit à petit, et qui permettent, euh, petit à petit, à, à avoir des références de, de regard, des, des éléments euh, techniques, pratiques, euh, de telle exposition, telle, etc. Mais le, 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 d'avoir une éducation, enfin, de, de savoir regarder quelque chose, ce n'est pas toujours évident, et on le voit de plus en plus dans toutes les manifestations et toutes les expositions. On n'a pas besoin du discours. Le discours peut venir peut-être après, mais l'important, je pense, c'est que chacun puisse, à travers son regard, avoir son propre, son propre propos. and myself to say who is going to translate Pascal's words. So it brings you back to those old days where we used to fight a lot. But now we're adults, we're over 50, so we're supposed to be very polite. Don't you translate. No. <laughs> What Pascal was saying about text, as it's just that I said, we are not art critics by training. We're not art historians by training. We are three architects uh, and, a, and, and a writer. Uh, and it's true, the way we were writing, uh, it's not that Of course, it had sometimes a lot of poetic flavor, but that's especially jean Lou uh, and then myself. But it was also a clear position to say, every time we were reading something in France, I'm talking about France, not the rest of the world, in those days, uh, referring to an African artist, uh, it, it was always put back in the context of Western art, and then trying to say, oh, this is Like, uh, if you're trying to make a reference in the using that lens, then it distorts also the work because you're completely disregarding the African context in which that work was created, whether it's political, cultural, social, whatsoever, and if you're only referencing with your Western lens. But that, I'm just, uh, because then John was saying, give some names. No, we're not going to give names. But I can say we're in 2019 and it's still going on. Uh, and I'm getting tired of that. I know that, uh, uh, Miriam, we had a conversation uh, in Casablanca a few months ago about, that because she has a magazine and that's the challenge. And today, even with Africa 2020 that I'm doing, we're about to release the logo. And I know that some people saw the logo and saying, oh, this is Kate Harris. I'm like, excuse me, this is like a Dembele, uh, Dembele uh, uh, graphic. What is Dembele? I'm saying, Oh, you're that ignoring, you don't know Dembele, but you, uh, you expect me to know who is Kate Harris. So it's just that, can we move the, um, the reference point from that kind of me, myself, and I, my little tiny French bubble, and say that the world is bigger and the, where you create your context. I, I spent an amazing New Year's Eve after party with Ayana in the car. Uh, and she's working on a very specific body of work. I will not detail because she's, it's still a work in progress. But herself, being an American, spending a lot of time in Senegal, working on something that is bridging these two uh, cultures, it's also about the context. So when the work will be out, I'm going to be curious how people are going to reference it, whether it's from Senegal or whether it's somebody from America. And I'm sure, I, I hope nobody from France will ever make any reference. But that was the real challenge also for us. It was also to say, We can write about art from Africa or from the diaspora, but we don't have to use these Western tools that are supposed to make you feel intelligent or to intimidate the reader, like you need a PhD in literature or in art history to be able to read the text and say, oh, voila, then I understand the artwork. That it's more simple sometimes, but then it gives it more sophistication. Et, bon, je, je continuerai en, en disant que le, L'écrit se trouvait quand même dans Revue Noire, se trouvait dans les Revues Noires, puisque on, on, finalement on ne l'acceptait réellement que s'il était sous forme d'un écrit d'écrivain, c'est-à-dire un écrit qui est une forme lit littéraire, euh, tout comme c'est le propre de l'existence d'un artiste art visuel, c'est de travailler par rapport au visuel, et de l'écrivain travailler par rapport à son, le style, par rapport à l'écrit, et c'est ce, où le visuel 
ou le style euh, littéraire qui transmet les idées plus que pour nous toute autre euh, divagation. Euh. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, and this is the reason why the people who are writing in the magazine were writers. Uh, we didn't want critics or historians, we wanted people who were writing fiction, I mean novelists, etc. Uh, people were writing. And uh, on that note, I would just add that uh, I always had a problem with art history uh, because history is supposed to be the past and uh, contemporaneity is supposed to be the future. So how could an art historian write about the future when he's only referring to the past? I mean, if you remember even the, uh, the European uh, golden age, the greatest writers about art were Apollinaire, Baudelaire, etc., etc. They were not art critics, they were writers. They were feeling what was going on. And I think that this world of yours, we're here to try to save Europe. I mean, get rid of your art historian, get rid of your art critics, and start to look at things and try to feel again. Try to feel again. It's something we, can, we could have done for you, but I mean, uh, nobody can see anymore. I mean, open up your, your gazes, stop reading bullshit, and try to feel for your own. Oh, no, I That uh, brings me to my next question, uh, because in Rive Noir, uh, there seem to be three disciplines that have more dominance than others. Uh, the fine arts, photography, and literature. And Simon, I, uh, one of your texts on uh, Beninese uh, theater, issue 18, and I'll quote, like musicians in an orchestra, actors also have an instrument to play. It is represented by their bodies and their voices, of course, but the musical score, the text, must not be neglected. So literature is an important component of Rive Noir, with the inclusion of works of writers and poets in each issue. Uh, could you expand on that? That is, firstly, how important was literature to Rive Noir? And secondly, what information does literature, fiction, poetry, give us on these countries that you focused on, and then more broadly on Africa. I mean, don't you think, Riasson, that uh, William Shakespeare have told us more about Britain than any historian? So of course, literature tells us more, because life is a, is a fiction uh, told by a fool and uh, filled with uh, furor and uh, Uh, whatever. You remember this uh, Macbeth thing? Beautiful. And literature tells more because uh, everything is a fiction, everything is a, a lie. At least literature, art, etc. Is, is a lie that is assumed, is a, is a lie that is sublimined. Uh, when, when Trump is lying, he's not making art. When uh, Magritte is saying this is not a pipe, he's telling us something. So yes, literature, but not, not only literature. You, you didn't mention music. The thing is that when we're talking about something, we just didn't want to talk about it. So it wouldn't have made sense for us to write on music. So when we could talk about music, we produced a CD where people could listen to music and not just to say, Africa three tones and they do baby ba ba ba. No would go and record a CD, release it, and put it on the magazine. Because th this is life, isn't it? And then movies, we produce films, etc. I mean, the idea was just to, not to talk about, but to, to show the things. Well, I think uh, people, when people think about uh, Rave Noir, they think about the visual art part, because maybe that was about 70% of the magazine. But there was always um, literature, eight pages at the end of the magazine, then showing uh, short novels, poetry, or uh, book reviews. There was also music, sometimes CD, when, he, when we had uh, money for that. Uh, fashion, design, I mean, all, all the different, let's say, creative or innovative 
fields uh, in the city where, that we were highlighting. So literature, of course, that was something important because it's also something important on the, on the continent. And we also wanted to go outside of what is obvious that this is a contemporary African art magazine, but we're not just showing visual art. It was about contemporary creativity in all these different disciplines. And Bruno Tiet, who was uh, just like Simon, who was the, the fourth founder, it was also a journalist and a, and a writer. So it also made something of... The strange thing is that you had three architects working uh, for the magazine, and we did publish very, very, very little architecture. Yeah. There, there, there's something that uh, Pascal just, just reminded me to mention, is that, again, you have you had, and you will have, the specialties of the speciality. We were not, we we're humble enough to, when we we're going on a place, when we we're going in a country, we would meet the people who knew about the country. We would ask people who were from the country or living in the country to tell us about the country. So we we're not like some people you might know who would come somewhere and explain to the Brazilian what it is to be a Brazilian. Uh, we were going there and we're asking people to tell us about what it is to be themselves. And if you look at Revue Noir, uh, there were always writers from within who were telling us about whatever they wanted to tell us. So it was not just a, us coming like an UFO in some place, you know, it reminds you of some other stories and telling to people, hey guys, this is who you are. Yeah, so the issues of self-representation were quite important, both in literature and in um, especially photography and arts. But at the same time, uh, you were also uh, exhibiting uh, photos from uh, that of, of photographers you were coming across uh, in exhibitions around the world. And uh, this must have been some of the first instances of contemporary black photography being exhibited internationally, uh, except perhaps for what Autograph was doing in London. Uh, and then also Bamako, Rencontre, the Biennale of uh, African Photography was created in 1994. What was Rive Noir's role in this Biennale? And uh, I mean, did Rive Noir spur an interest in African photography in the West? C'est vrai qu'il y avait un problème. Euh, chaque fois qu'on qu qu rencontrait des professionnels de la photographie, là, des, des, des grands, on, tous, les, tous les grands professionnels de, de, de France, d'Angleterre, de, disaient toujours qu'il n'y avait pas de photographie en Afrique. Mais alors, ils étaient formels, tous. Et c'est vrai que ça nous a amusés. On, on a pris ça comme un défi de dire, mais il, il en existe. Alors, effectivement... Quand on a fait le numéro sur Londres, on a pris des, des, des Londoniens, enfin en réalité des, des Africains de la diaspora. Mais ensuite, on a, on a eu une démarche qui est totalement différente. On ne voulait pas avoir des photographies, euh, quand, on, quand on faisait des numéros, on voulait avoir des photographies faites par des photographes africains. Et c'est comme ça que chaque fois, on demandait à un certain nombre de photographes de photographier leur ville, parce que... Bien sûr, il y a beaucoup de photographes qui, fait, qui pour pouvoir euh, vivre de son travail, ben, c'est des photographes de boîte de nuit ou des photographes d'identité. Mais il y en a beaucoup qui, effectivement, pouvaient faire autre chose. Et c'est comme ça qu'on a pu rencontrer un certain nombre de photographes. Bon, il y a eu beaucoup d'échecs dans ce qu'on a fait. C'est ce qui fait qu'on a rencontré des dizaines de milliers de photographes au, au fil des numéros, puisqu'on en a publié une, un peu moins d'un millier. Mais on a publié quand même un millier. Et chaque fois, on passait des commandes. Et c'est comme ça que petit à petit, on a découvert qu'il y avait des richesses folles en, en matière de photographie et avec des noms de photographes derrière. Parce que très souvent, il y avait des photographies qui circulaient, mais à nouveau comme des photographies exotiques. Quoi. Il y avait effectivement un Sedoqueta, je crois, dans l'exposition Africa Explorers, non mm -hmm. C'est ça mais ils avaient mis anonyme sous mmh. ces deux quêta. Voilà, c'était des petites choses qui étaient... Et c'est des choses qui... Mais il n'y en avait qu'une d'image, il n'y en avait pas 50. Hein. Et... Et donc, ça nous a quand même titillé. Euh, sur cette histoire-là, j'aimerais aller jusqu'au bout, puisque c'était... Nous, on n'était pas... Con... On n'arrivait plus à financer... On avait réussi à financer trois numéros de Revue Noire, 
et on pensait que ça allait se terminer. Ce qui faisait que le troisième numéro de Revue Noire, on a fait, on a fait un numéro de photographie africaine, un, un spécial photographie africaine. <rire> Pensant que c'était notre dernier numéro. Et bon, ce qui n'a pas été le cas, mais il n'en reste pas moins, c'était symboliquement important pour vous dire l'esprit dans, dans lequel on, on, on travaillait, parce qu'on avait découvert que autant les productions d'art plastique étaient à destination souvent des publics européens, autant les productions de photographie en Afrique étaient à destination des Africains. Ce qui faisait et ce qui donnait, c'est-à-dire que le client ne devenait plus euh, un blanc ou un voyageur, mais devenait euh, ben, les gens du pays quoi, qui décidaient à tous les niveaux de se montrer comme ils avaient envie de se montrer. Et, et donc, et donc ça a été une véritable révélation. Et, et c'est pour ça qu'on a pu faire en 1992, je pense, la première exposition de photographes africains euh, à Beaubourg, euh, au centre de Wallonie-Bruxelles, où il y a eu la première exposition de photographie africaine en 1992. Et c'est cette exposition, ainsi que la, notre, notre édition de beaucoup de photographes dans tous les numéros, qui a permis, effectivement, de pouvoir faire les rencontres de Bamako, trois ans après. Voilà. Histoire. Mais c'est effectivement quelque chose de fondamental. On peut dire que... Parce que c'est comme, comme la musique, où la musique, elle ne s'adresse pas à l'exportation. Elle s'adresse d'abord à sa propre population. La photographie, c'est pareil. Et la production des formes, c'était quand même assez étonnant de voir à quel point il y avait un vrai renouvellement des formes. Enfin bon, je dis ça, mais ça, je veux dire, Gonnet comme Simon peuvent... Hein et l'anthologie, effectivement, euh, de, en 98, fait... De... Sans entrer dans la comptabilité, la, les premières rencontres de Bamako, euh, les rencontres, combien d'expositions Rue Noire, combien d'expositions oh ben, Je ne sais pas, nous on avait fait 16 en tous les cas, oui. Je crois que les rencontres, on avait 5 ou 6. Non, non, t'exagères, je crois qu'ils en ont fait beaucoup, mais... Euh... Ah, les 10 <rire> Non, non, mais on n'a pas de... Ce n'était pas, pas le sujet. Le sujet, c'était effectivement, tout d'un coup, qu'il y avait quelque chose qui se révélait par rapport à tous les professionnels du monde entier qui ne savaient pas que ça existait, quoi, tout simplement. D'ailleurs, comme tout l'art contemporain euh, qui existait en Afrique. Quoi. Mais là, je pense que l'un des deux doit traduire en, en y mettant sa sauce. Allez, petite. I love when he calls me the young one. I met him, he was 30, and he was saying for 20 years, I'm 30. But that was more than 30 years ago. That gives you a sense of how old he is. Um, and I'm slightly younger than him, but less than five years longer. Anyway, uh, what Jean was trying to say, that what uh, was also something uh, interesting in those days, professional, photography professional, whether they were curators, museum directors, or festival directors, they were all saying there's no African photography, there's no photography in Africa. And they were saying that's not true, because precisely for each issue of Revue Noire, the principle was the same. You go to a country, you set up an editorial team locally, hiring young writers and also hiring of photographers to take pictures, of course, of the artworks, but also of the city, and meeting also other photographers. And so it's by meeting different people each time you do this kind of uh, remote and temporary uh, editorial uh, boards that you create the network, and that you start um, uh, identifying so many photographers. And they were saying when they started River Noir, they thought the magazine would last for only three editions. So the third one that was supposed to be the last one, it was a 100% issue dedicated to photography. Obviously, it didn't end, the third issue, because that was before I arrived. Um, and then they, they, they kept on going and saying it was always the same thing. In France, you had people with very strong positions in the, in the art world saying, This doesn't exist in Africa. This doesn't exist in Africa. They say, seriously, we're going to show you that it does exist. So the magazine was just the evidence of that. And the um, Bamako Banya that was created by France, that's how it also started. Because they were uh, already working with a network of photographers in different countries, they decided, okay, we're going to bring exhibitions at the Bamako Banya. But before that, they already had an exhibition in 92 uh, in Paris, and that was the first uh, exhibition of African photography in Paris. I don't know that many scholars have that in their 
database or track record that was at Pompidou and at the Centre Wallonie Bruxelles. And then continuing in the magazine, hiring, working with photographers. And then that led us in 98 to do the anthology of African photography with the exhibition of 400 photographs from the late 19th century up to the mid uh, 90s with 400 photographs of different generations, not just portrait photography but also documentary etc etc that toured on three uh, continents for, for for two years so of course obviously photography was important because we were working with photographers for each uh, edition and it's also about how do you claim your, your yourself like Photography, what he was saying that uh, contemporary art, you can see that some artists were producing art for, let's say, the Western market, but also art for the locals. But with photography, all the photographers, there, the main market was a local market. So that gave it, it made it something very specific and something very different that they felt, I say they because I wasn't there yet, I was still a very successful architect, hoping that I will remain an architect. Uh, and that's how they were just consistently working with, uh, with, with photographers and publishing photography. And then that's how it grow and that we create. But everything was about building that network on the continent and with the Jasper. Um, I, 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 I shall, I mean, to, to summarize the whole thing and, and to tell you, because I know you, you're a wannabe scholar, and you're going to talk about uh, the politics of representation and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the exhibition of photography that we did was called Africa by Africa. You can translate it by Africa by itself or Africa by Africans. So it tells exactly the, the whole philosophy behind it. Uh, people were, were showing themselves and telling about themselves and not being shown all the time. Uh, yeah, thanks, Simon. So I'm just going to ask one last question before we open up uh, for some questions. Um, and I'm going to round off uh, this session by going back to Paris, because it starts in Paris. Uh, and what I would also like to say is that um, this will be the first of a series of discussions on, on Rive Noir. We hope to continue this in September at uh, Cité des Arts in Paris. So watch out for those details. Uh, you can just join the Cité des Arts, Cité International des Arts um, Facebook page. You'll find out information. Uh, but just going back to the last question, um, Jean-Luc, you wrote in uh, an article entitled uh, The Dusk of Idols, I think it was around about issue, maybe it was another issue on Paris. Uh, you talk about how difficult it is for African artists in Paris who have had to exhibit, I mean, who live, who come to Paris, but then exhibit elsewhere in Dusseldorf, in Berlin, in New York. Um, so they come to Paris hoping to, to become artists and to make a living, but actually it's other cities around the world that um, are more open to their work. Has Paris evolved since uh, 1996? And are there more institutions, opportunities open to African contemporary art today? I mean, this is open to everyone on the panel, yeah. C'est Gonnet qui va répondre. Tu plaisantes. Uh, I, I have no clue. Uh, yeah, they don't want to answer. That's that's very interesting. The fact they does they don't want to answer gives you the answer. I don't think it personally, so I'm going to speak just for myself because I'm back in Paris since last year, kind of permanently, supposed to be working on something uh, for next year. I don't think if you scratch the surface, honestly, I don't think it has changed that much because the artists I know uh, who left in those days, 
because there was just this impossibility to break the glass ceiling, I will say, left. Uh, and only one came back, that's um, Billy Bijoka. Uh, and I know that artists from the continent who are having success based outside of the continent, are 99% of them are not living in France. So that's, that also says something about that country. I would say more largely that I don't think that France fancies contemporary art at all. I would add that France does not fancy young artists. Just look at the French Pavilion. Anytime they have a, a young artist like Annette Messager, or a young artist like Bustamante, or a young artist like Daredi, da -da -da. I, I just think that uh, France I mean, they love, and we, we all love Notre Dame, but I think they prefer Notre Dame to any contemporary uh, artist. Okay, on that note, we, we, we are closing down this uh, panel immediately. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm joking. Just to open up uh, the discussion, uh, any questions from the audience, please? Um, Plenty, this uh, question over here. Thank you. Donc, je, je vais poser mes questions en français et, et puis ensuite, euh, <laughs> vous déciderez qui répond. Moi, je vous remercie, c'était vraiment passionnant. Donc, euh, donc, je me présente, je suis Maryam Septi, je viens du Maroc où je dirige un, un magazine qui, qui essaie d'exister de, sur le continent africain, un magazine en langue française qui s'appelle Diptyque. Et donc, euh, j'ai vécu ces, ces 30 années. Donc, de, moi, quand vous faisiez Revue Noire, au début, j'étais encore étudiante. Et j'ai des souvenirs de Revue Noire, notamment de, du numéro sur le, le Maroc, qui a fondamentalement modifié à un moment donné la, la scène contemporaine marocaine. Donc, j'aurais deux questions pour vous. La première qui, qui concerne la manière dont vous financiez Revue Noire, parce que le, le financement des, des revues, euh, n'est pas qu'un sujet périphérique. Souvent, il, évidemment, il, il conditionne euh, le genre de revue qu'on va faire. Donc, soit on a un mécène formidable qui, de préférence, n'est pas du tout dans le domaine de l'art. Il vous dit, écoutez, moi, je vous finance, faites ce que vous voulez. Et à ce moment-là, on peut aller dans des directions euh, hallucinantes, mais en tout cas dans des directions de liberté. Et quand on est financé par euh, des acteurs de l'art ou des acteurs économiques d'un pays, euh, ce qui est parfois évidemment notre cas, on est un peu obligé aussi de, de naviguer dans leurs attentes euh, de contrepartie. Alors la, la deuxième question concerne... Oui, alors la première. Uh, the first question was about funding. How does one found a magazine? Where do you find the, the money? And do you have a sleeping partner? Do you have a partner involved in art, etc., etc.? So how did Revenue work financially? L'argent. Mais l'argent, oui, c'est le problème. Pascal says that we were all go-go boys. We were, <laughs> were dancing at night. And <laughs> hein? Okay, the, the business model, it was their money. He said he's angry, he doesn't want to say it because he, that's why we couldn't pay um, people a lot. That's why we're only the two uh, that were permanently paid. Uh, and the, the rest of the money was to pay the, the editorial team in, the, in each city where it happened, whether it's the writers, the journalists, and the, and the photographers. And uh, yes, and then you have the print, etc., etc., and all the other administrative costs. But the magazine was hosted in their house uh, in Paris, uh, and they started the magazine with their money. And when they ran out of money, that was uh, the beginning of difficult times. You also have to remember that in those days, because people used to say, oh, there was no advertisement, that is so posh. It's because it didn't interest anybody in France, because it was a niche, and because people were still saying, there's no contemporary creativity on this continent. Thank you very much. Oh, it looks nice, it's very glossy, but yes, but thanks, no. Which makes me just want to make one comment uh, because he's making personal comments, so I also have to write to make comments. 
I'm, I've been hearing a lot these past years because of art fairs, African art fairs, and whatsoever, or exhibitions. Uh, and I was, I was told that uh, two years ago, uh, from a, two days ago, from a sponsor. No, actually, that was yesterday, which made me very, very angry last night. That Africa, l'Afrique est à la mode. Uh, Africa is hype. Um, so it has to stop. So anybody in this room, if you hear that comment, please reverse it because if you allow people, because now they are finally waking up, now they have their own personal interests, therefore Africa is hyped only today because they are waking up, that's just unacceptable because that just denies what we have been doing and what pe other people around the world and sometimes before us have been doing. Artists have been existing, writers have been writing, publishers have been publishing before this teeny tiny little circuit in Paris are saying Africa is a fashion. We're not a fashion, we're an amazing continent. And it was done with their money. I, 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 shall, I, shall, I shall add one note on this uh, money business. We were so great uh, professionals uh, that we, we went to uh, a guy who is dealing with, uh, with advertisement. Uh, we said, we need advertisement. He said, okay, I'll find advertisement for you. And then we said, but we don't want cars. We don't want coffee. We don't want... He said, well, do you want advertisement? Say, yes, but not any advertisement. We want them to be stylish. We want them to. Uh, so, result of it is, okay, guys, <laughs> see you later. So, I mean, the, the magazine was was a, a, a totality, and a, a, an ad could not just come like this. When uh, Agnes B uh, gave us a bit of money, we told her, this is how you have to design your page. So my second question concerns uh, the critics. Donc vous disiez tout à l'heure que vous faisiez, enfin c'était très intéressant le, le, euh, vos interventions sur la critique. Et ce qui m'intéresse de savoir, c'est est-ce que vous pensez que le, le style revue noire, la manière dont vous avez convoqué plutôt des écrivains, donc Simon disait que finalement les plus grands critiques de Baudelaire à, à Diderot, Claudel et tous ceux qui ont écrit sur l'art étaient davantage des, des écrivains. Est-ce que vous pensez avoir euh, réinventé un nouveau discours sur l'art beaucoup plus narratif à une époque où justement la critique plutôt américaine euh, était très euh, euh, je sais pas trop comment l'appeler euh, aidez moi euh, euh, très spécialiste un peu e exclusive aussi s'adressant uniquement dans un entre soi euh, de personnes qui font référence à des choses qui sont les seules à, à connaître est ce que du coup vous avez euh, réinventé une forme de, de discours sur l'art hein, de une, une façon d'écrire sur l'art merci on n'a rien réinventé, on a perpétué une tradition qui pouvait exister sur le regard sur l'art. Et il y a des revues, il y a eu des, des revues qui effectivement faisaient autre chose que de la, de la fausse critique en reprenant très, très souvent les dossiers de presse de, de, des galeries ou des, ou des, ou des, ou des institutions. C'est vrai que bon, nous, nous, étions, nous faisions un travail d'investigation qui fait qu'on est une des, une des rares revues au monde à faire de l'investigation. Et, et c'était sous cette forme-là qu'on voulait la restituer. On ne voulait pas faire une revue pour faire une revue, on voulait faire une revue pour, justement, affirmer un autre regard sur l'art. Mais ce n'était pas, on ne réinventait rien. Je veux dire, on, était, on est dans une tradition, comme dit Simon. Je veux dire, on, on, on savait très bien d'entrée de jeu qu'on ne voulait pas être dans un... un un discours critique. Il faut toujours les écouter, les discours critiques. Je veux dire, même quand vous avez des gens qui travaillent sur des sujets, on a l'impression qu'il faut qu'ils disent la moitié de conneries. Euh, ils ne sont pas obligés, mais ils le font. Quand tout d'un coup, Jean-Loup Amsel dit que Ousmane Sow, c'est le Michel-Ange de l'Afrique, ben, je veux dire, il faut l'avoir entendu une fois dans sa vie. Quoi. Et tout est comme ça. Je veux dire, vous avez toujours des références qui sont faites à des gens qui n'ont rien à foutre dans cette histoire-là. Et c'est pour ça que la forme elle-même est aussi importante. C'était une des choses que je n'arrivais pas à comprendre, c'est qu'un jour on a été convoqué à, à l'AICA, à l'Association internationale des critiques d'art, j'espère qu'il y en a quelques-uns ici, euh, pour que je puisse dire du mal de ça. Euh, et c'est vrai que c'est assez étonnant de voir ces gens-là qui à un moment donné disaient « Votre vue, elle est pas mal, mais franchement, 
il manque de contenu. Alors, je lui dis, ah, bah, tiens donc. Et parce qu'effectivement, il n'y avait, avait pas un de ces gens-là qui écrivait dedans. Je veux dire, le jour où ils, le jour où ils décident d'écrire, ils ont, ils ont le droit d'être publiés, bien sûr. Mais avant, ils faisaient n'importe quoi. Donc, c'est pour ça que je dis à parler que, de dire que Ousmane Sow, c'est uh, Michel-Ange, c'est quand même... C'est ça qu'on ne voulait pas, quoi. C'est très clair. Donc, on n'a rien réinventé. On perpétue une façon de regarder le monde et de se dire que quand on fabrique une forme, c'est une forme. So. The question was, uh, did you invent a new way, a new approach about writing on art? And the answer was that we invented nothing. We, we perpetuated a tradition of people writing on art. Uh, but what we wanted to avoid is to become the specialist of something that was not to be specialized, but to have people who are talking about things. And he, he remembered a, a meeting with the ICA, I don't know how you say that in English, but the Association of uh, Art Critics, and uh, they were telling, uh, oh, your magazine is great, but uh, there's no contents. I mean, at the end, the magazine was 100 pages full of contents, but what they meant was that there's no one of us writing, to make a long story short. You, you don't have a, a critical apparatus, ba ba bi ba ba ba. And this is precisely what, what we did not want. And one of those brilliant guy, and he's not even an art historian, I think he's a sociologist or an anthropologist, even worse, Jean-Louis Hamsel, who wrote once that uh, Ousmane So was the African Michelangelo. And Jean-Louis was like, well, you need guts to say such stupid things. Uh, because those so has nothing had nothing to do with Michelangelo, etc., etc. So the problem of the critics is that they need to critic. But in order to critic, you at least might need to know what you're talking about. But then we're talking about a time where, as I told you, I knew nothing about Africa before Avignon. Avignon allowed me to to know more about Africa, to discover about Africa. So let's not talk about the other. So how can you talk about something that you don't know? Well, you talk about the thing you know, and you paste it on the thing you don't know. So this cut and paste thing doesn't really work, even if it used to work before Revue Noir. Right now, people are aware that it just doesn't work. Um, hello. Um, thank you guys for all of this information. Actually, I've obviously been a fan of Revue Noir uh, since the beginning of my time in Paris, but I didn't know as much of the history, so this was really uh, informative for me, and I really appreciate um, getting to know Revue Noir a bit more. Um, I just have a question. It's a two-part question, um, because obviously I am in solidarity about not talking about contemporary art coming from the continent or contemporary African art as something that's demoed, that's in style. Um, but we are experiencing a moment where um, for many people it is the first moment of, um, of engagement. And I'm curious to, to know, are you hopeful? Do you feel that there is anything that is coming out of this particular kind of bit of fever? Um, and then the reason I'm asking about that is because also I'm, I'm, it's, I feel as though we're coming up with issues around gatekeeping. Um, as you mentioned, at a certain point, artists would push back because if they weren't in Revue Noir, they weren't relevant. In the United States, if you did not show in the Studio Museum, you were not relevant as a black artist. Um, and it continues in a way, uh, somehow, to... I feel that it is opening somehow, but I, I still wonder. And then, uh, within that issue of gatekeeping, do you think that um, things like contemporary and, and also, you know, uh, you know, obviously we have these art fairs um, and other publications and just kind of all these things that are happening. Do you think um, it's creating a, st a stress? I'm asking because you're, for the first time, in my perspective, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, you have an acceptance and space being created for the first person perspective in terms of curating, in terms of art historians, in terms of um, scholars, in terms of theorists, in terms of the, the commercial space and on and on and and the, many of these people are non-white. And um, I'm experiencing in certain moments and I'm hearing anecdotal evidence in certain moments that we have a kind of a competition and kind of people trying not 
to trying to hold on to the content and not allow for the space for these new, th this generation to come through. So I'm wondering how you feel about that. Um. No, f first of all, I think that we, we should get uh, away from the discoverer's time. It's not because Europe is saying, oh, it exists, that it is existing. And if Europe is saying it exists, it's simply because it has been existing. It's simply because people have been working. I mean, the fact that the market is saying, ha, 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 I really don't care about it. Because for me, it means that people have been working in Africa. I mean, BC Silva, how are you doing? Uh, she opened a space in, in, uh, in Lagos. Uh, Didier Shub. How are you doing? And Wella Marlin opened a space in Cameroon. Uh, Muatez Nazri opened a space in uh, Cairo. Uh, you have a space in St. Louis, photography. Koyoko opened a space, etc., etc. I mean, there have been people working. So let's not confuse the fact that some people are just discovering things. I mean, too bad for them. And I mean, an, an artist should not easy to say, but an artist should not work for anything but for what he's doing. Uh, I'll give you one example of a, a very young artist. Uh, somebody came to him and said, well, Mr. Jamie, you discovered him. And I'm like, I would discover my father. This guy was much older than me, and he was, he's been working for 40 years. He was there. And some people saw him all of a sudden. It doesn't mean that he did not exist. So let's not confuse the fact that some people are waking up with a kind of a buzz or whatever. Because if that was to be a buzz, a buzz comes and goes. But I think that whatever is going to happen is the result of hard work. Elan who have been working for 40 years before people decided to buy his work. But L could have been working for 60 years without giving a damn about selling or not selling. And this is it. This is it. I think what's interesting in these times uh, is that you have that new young generation of curators, writers, editors, publishers, uh, starting art fairs, uh, small festivals, uh, art centers, workshops. Uh, on the continent and also abroad. So there are, you have this multiplicity of voices that are also posi positioning things uh, in our times. It feels old to say that, but it's true. We, we, I've, we felt very lonely. Uh, and, and just now what I'm seeing, sometimes I, I, I look at the, the young ones, I'm saying, you are just jumping like little monkeys, thinking that you, but you're just the king of the jungle. And you have no idea that if, you'll be, if you're able today to jump and to rush around, it's because you had people like us, but we're not the only ones, who have been knocking down walls for you to be able to jump. Uh, I'm not saying that I want every time that people bend over when we walk through, but just keep that in mind. It's easy in the 2019 or in the tw 21st century, it was really not easy in our times, and we had to fight very, uh, very strategic battles, and th those battles were, you're doing a magazine, you're doing a publication, you're doing an exhibition, and you keep on saying no, and you have principles. And the fact that today you have that generation, I think it's also their responsibility. Anytime somebody says Africa is the new fashion or Africa is hype, to say no, because people have been working and producing on this continent for decades. And it's the fact that you're stating that you're just stating your ignorance or that maybe you need a, an exotic fruit every decade to show that you exist and that you have something to rely on, but that's your own problem and go and find a therapist. Africans are not your, your next uh, therapist. But that's just the message for the young generation. Some are here. Keep that in mind. What are you doing? Is it because you want to be famous? Or is it because you believe in what you do? do you, are you inspired by the work of artists? And just keep in mind that you are where you are today because people like us existed and made some sacrifices, and in some cases, serious financial sacrifices.
thank you. I, I just want to thank, can we have a round of applause for our panelists for giving their time? Thank you. We can go home now. <laughs>